Why classify things? Well, primarily for convenience. Grouping organisms and information allows scientists to deal with facts as a whole, rather than the random collection of information without logic or organization. Imagine going to a grocery store with a shopping list. How do you know where to go? Well, you generally know where to find something based on the way the store is organized. The outer perimeter is fruits, vegetables, seafood, meat, and dairy, while the internal section has aisle numbers for user convenience, where items are grouped accordingly. The science of classifying organisms? Well, that's called taxonomy. Taxonomy, a classification into ordered categories. Tax, meaning method. Onomy, meaning regulating something. Looking at Aristotle, Aristotle was the first to classify organisms. Aristotle classified organisms based on their appearance, but there were many flaws because some animals seemed to overlap groups or not fit well into any group. Today's standards, taxonomists use a classification hierarchy based on appearance as well as internal anatomy. Now, appearance internal anatomy is going to differ. Internal anatomy, these organisms have kidneys. Uh, some organisms have lungs, while others, like birds, have air sacs, and fish, well, they have gills. For external, we have fish have scales, we have birds have feathers, frogs have smooth skin, turtles, yeah, they have scales, but it's a le very leathery type of appearance and feeling. And then you have the raccoon, which either has fur or hair. Now, today's classification system, uh, from it's organized from the most general to the most specific. The most general is going to be kingdom, and as you drill down to the most specific, it goes kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Here's my golden retriever, Charlie. He belongs to the animal kingdom. The phylum is under chordata, which... My dog is a vertebrate animal, so he has a backbone. The class is a mammal. He's warm-blooded. The order is carnivora, carnivorous animals, but they're actually more omnivorous, uh, meaning that he eats plants and, and meat. Uh, members of this classification are distinguished by having powerful jaws and teeth adapted for stabbing, tearing, and eating flesh. Uh, the family is Candidae. Uh, he has four well-developed toes, Plus a dew claw. That dew claw is like that little elbow pad that dogs have. Other animals have them also, such as wolves, coyotes, and jackals. He belongs to the genus of Canis, which is directly descended from a wolf. And his species is Canis lupus. It's breeds a golden retriever, and he goes by the name of Charlie. Now, humans, we belong to the animal kingdom also. Uh, we are also underneath the chordata, meaning that we have, we are vertebrates. We have a spinal cord. Class is a mammal, so we're vertebrate animals, such as other animals like rats, cats, dogs, deers, monkeys, bats, hey, even whales. Uh, order is primates. This includes humans, monkeys, and apes. Um, the family is hominane which is all modern and extinct great apes. Genus, we belong to the Homo genus, which is modern, modern humans. And the species is Homo sapiens, um, transferring to wise men. Looking at comparing these two uh, animal species, my dog Charlie and humans, we're all the same up until the order. So the order is going to change. Uh, my dog is carnivora, where we are primates. Now, this two-name naming, known as binomial nomenclature, common names were used for organisms for many years, but unfortunately, people use different common names for the same organism. So Carolus Linnaeus came along. Linnaeus proposed a system called binomial nomenclature, or two-name naming, to solve this problem. Uh, Latin was proposed because it was a dead language, so it would be consistent for the ages. And an organism is named with two names, genus and species. For example, Iquus caballus, which is the name for the common horse. Looking at the kingdoms, there are five kingdoms in total. Uh, Monera, 
protists, fungi, plantae, and animalia. Here, what we see is the phylogenic tree of life. The first cells would have likely been primitive prokaryotic cells, which may have only had organic compounds such as RNA surrounded by a membrane. Based on fossil evidence, prokaryotes appeared on Earth 3.5 to 3.8 billion years ago, making them the first inhabitants on Earth. From there, evolution happened. Looking at Kingdom Monera, uh, it's the most abundant organisms on Earth. These organisms are unicellular, they're prokaryotic, meaning they lack a nucleus, and there's two types. You have U bacteria, often cause disease and are decomposers. So if you've had strep throat, streptococcus pyogenes, uh, food poisoning, bacillus cereus, or been bitten by a rat or contaminated food or water, you've had spirillium minus. The other form of Monera is the archaea bacteria. Some live in extreme environments, such as underwater sea vents, uh, acidic and salty environments where other organisms just cannot survive. Now, these organisms that live in underwater sea vents are known to be as chemosynthetic, where they use chemicals as their source of energy. Uh, that picture on the left, a picture taken from Yellowstone National Park, this is the Norris Geyser Basic, where the pH can be anywhere from like a 2 to a 4. And to the far right, you have the Bonneville Salt Flats. Uh, they host thriving uh, microbial communities and have been adapted to live in these harsh conditions to where they become to where if they became in contact with water, it will most likely kill them. Going on our worksheet, we have bacteria. Again, there's two types: uh, bacteria and archaea. Uh, you have bacteria; they're prokaryotic, no nucleus, found nearly everywhere. And then you have archaea. Again, they're also prokaryotic, meaning they do not have a nucleus. They're found in extreme environments, like high salt, no oxygen areas, and very acidic environments. Going to the next kingdom, we have Kingdom Protista. Looking at the pyogenic tree of life, uh, these are organisms with cells that contain a nucleus as well as a membrane-bound organelle. Kingdom Protus, some protists are ototrophic. Uh, meaning that protists possess chlorophyll that helps them in photosynthesis. For example, like the giant kelp or sea lettuce. It's also um, being photosynthetic and having chlorophyll um, gives you that green color. While other protists are heterotrophic, meaning it has to get its food from other plants or animals. Looking at one protus, uh, we have the paramecium, and what we see here is a diagram of some internal organelles that it has. First, we have the membrane um, found organelle that has DNA inside, this is known as a nucleus. Uh, from here, we have an organelle known as microtubules. Microtubules um, are for structure and support. We have the endoplasmic reticulum, which also goes by ER. This creates ribosomes for protein synthesis. There's the Golgi, ap Golgi apparatus, which modifies and packages proteins. We have the mitochondria, uh, which generates chemical energy for all cells. Here we're looking at a video of a paramecium. The paramecium is kind of like this foot-looking um, organelle, organ that is um, traveling around. Um, and it has a contractile vacuole. You'll notice this part um, that's kind of getting bigger and smaller. It's this uh, kind of like star shaped that's surrounding it. Um, what happens is that it's taking in water and then it's releasing water and expels that water. And by contracting this water out, the paramecium is able to move. Another way a paramecium is able to move is that it belongs to a group known as ciliates. Uh, ciliates are single-celled organisms that at some stage in their life cycle uh, possesses cilia. Uh, cilia are short hair-like organelles used for locomotion and also food gathering. The next protist we're going to look at is known as an amoeba. Uh, humans pick up amoebas from drinking water in unde underdeveloped areas where there is poor sanitation and water is untreated. 
Uh, these amoeba may invade the wall of the intestine, leading to uh, amniotic dysentery, an illness that causes intestinal ulcers, bleeding, and even diarrhea. Um, looking at the structure of an amoeba, we see that an amoeba also has a nucleus. It has this um, pseudopod. Uh, the pseudopod is cytoplasm that will extend out, allowing for the cell to move. Uh, the pseudopod is also known as a false foot. Um, the inside of these cells has cytoplasm. It's a watery gel-like substance, provides structure for the cell parts so they can move freely within the cell. On the outside of the cell, we have a semi-permeable membrane known as the cell membrane. This allows water and other materials to come into and out of the cell. Just like the paramecium, uh, it also has a contractile vacuole that will either swell with water and then expel water. And then the way parame um, an amoeba eats is um, food particles. Um, any organism that is smaller than it, it's going to eat. So looking at this video here, we have a small paramecium and we have the amoeba extending its pseudopods around the paramecium. So since this is a microscopic image, um, microscopic images look all the way from like the top down. So th in reality, this is a 3D structure um, because you're looking at it under a microscope, you're looking at it more um, where the paramecium is trapped. Um, regardless, the false feet, these pseudopods are going to surround the paramecium and it's going to tighten and tighten and tighten, um, meaning the cell's death. Here we have another protist known as the euglena. Uh, as we've seen, it has a contractile vacuole, has a cell membrane, has chloroplasts, uh, mitochondria uh, it has. Uh, mitochondria is um, the site of cellular respiration and uh, the cell is able to um, undergo um, various cell processes um, having mitochondria. Also has a flagella. Flagella is a whip-like tail and allows the cell to move. Uh, here again, we have chloroplasts. Uh, chloroplasts is an organelle within the cell of plants and certain algae. That is the site of photosynthesis. If you don't know what photosynthesis is, it's a process by which energy from the sun is converted into chemical energy for growth. Euglena are unicellular organisms that belong to the genus Protist. As such, they are not plants, animals, or fungi. In particular, they share some characteristics of both plants and animals. While they can manufacture their own food, a characteristic seen in plants, they are also capable of movement and consuming food, which are characteristics of animals. Euglena live in fresh and brackish water, rich in organic matter, and can also be found in moist soils. Euglena are characterized by an elongated cell with one nucleus, numerous chlorophyll-containing chloroplasts, a contractile vacuole, an eye spot, and one or two flagella. Unlike plant cells, euglena lack a rigid cellulose wall and have a flexible pellicle that allows them to change shape. Though they are photosynthetic, most species can also feed heterotrophically and absorb food directly through the cell surface. So, kingdom protists, uh, either autotrophic or heterotrophic, meaning that it can make its own food or it has to go out and find food could be mobile or stationary. Some stationary ones that we saw in the kelp, in the kelp forests uh, deep in the ocean. Um, protists could be microscopic or the size of several meters long. Because of the vast differences in this kingdom, um, it is sometimes known as the junk kingdom. So protists, microscopic or very large, mostly unicellular, autotrophic or heterotrophic. Kingdom fungi. Looking at the phylogenetic tree of life is a eukaryote, um, and you can see it on the far right-hand side. Now, king of fungi used to be in the plant kingdom because they appear to have similarities with plants, but they are, in fact, very different. Uh, fungi is a heterotrophic decomposer. They're dependent on others as they cannot make their own food. They feed on the dead and decaying organic matter. Um, Fungi could either be unicellular or multicellular, meaning one cell or multicells. The evolutionist concept 
has been disseminated by different branches of human knowledge. Just as mushroom spores are spread on a cool breeze. Each new season, countless spores are released into the autumn air by the mushroom kingdom. Over the period of a few days, each organism tries to reproduce to the best of its ability. Go to our work, worksheet of fungi. We have unicellular, multicellular, heterotrophic, um, to re reproduce using spores, as we just saw in that last video. Uh, Kingdom plantae, a uh, phylogenetic tree of life. It is a eukaryotic cell. Here, uh, plants are autotrophic, meaning they have to perform photosynthesis. Uh, this is an equation that the plants undergo. Um, this is an equation for photosynthesis. Plants take in carbon dioxide and water as um, reactants. Um, plants use chloroplasts, which take in the radiant energy from the sun. And then you have a product, glucose and oxygen. Here we have a plant cell. A plant cell has a large vacuole, as you can see, because plants feed on water. Um, plants also have a cell wall made of cellulose, which is a chain of sugar molecules. In particular, it is made up of linked molecules of the sugar glucose. Uh, that chain structure makes cellulose a polymer, so it's more than one sugar. Um, in this kingdom... We have, yes, they're autotrophic. They perform auto, uh, photosynthesis. Plants are stationary. They cannot move. And they range in size from tiny moss to giant sequoias. Here, plants are multicellular. Uh, cell walls made of cellulose and are autotrophic. Finally, our last kingdom, Animalia. Here we have an animal cell known as a eukaryotic cell. Therefore, it has membrane-bound organelles. We have the nucleus, which is the control center of the cell. It has DNA. You have mitochondria, which is the site of cellular respiration. Um, mitochondria is really important. Um, some cells that are more functioning than others are going to have more mitochondria. For example, the liver cell contain, contains either about like one to 2,000 mitochondria in each cell, um, whereas heart and muscle cells contain about 5,000 mitochondria per cell. Um, these cells need more energy, so they contain more mitochondria than the other organs in the body. Next, we have the endoplasmic reticulum, as we saw in the paramecium. Um, endoplasmic reticulum, it has ribosomes attached to it and is, is involved in protein synthesis. Some other organelles that has essentials, which is development of spin, spindle fibers, which uh, aids in the process of cell division which is a part of mitosis and meiosis. Um, another organelle is a lysosome that contains digestive enzymes and breaks down um, the broken down and dead organelles with, with inside of the cell. And then finally, to me, the most important organelle is that surrounding the cell, um, which is this semi-permeable membrane known as the cell membrane that surrounds the cytoplasm of the cell. That cytoplasm is that gel-like fluid that harbors a safe area for all the organelles to be inside of. Now, in this kingdom, we are all heterotrophic. We have to go find our own food. We cannot make our own food. Uh, eukaryotic means to have a nucleus. Uh, we have a nucleus, control center of the cell, which the DNA can be found inside. Uh, Kingdom Animalia, um, all organisms are multicellular. So we're talking about like we're having trillions of cells um, just within our human body. In this kingdom, most are able to move. And I say most because you have coral, which is put into this kingdom and they cannot move. Um, Kingdom Animalia, most have definitive tissues and organs. So we start out with the most basic unit. We have a cell. Um, cells together is going to create tissues. Tissues together are going to create an organ. Organs um, go on to create an organ system. And then once you have this organ system, then you have a complete organism. So finally, going to our worksheet, Animalia. We have multicellular, no cell wall. These organisms are heterotrophic. 
um, has a, these are eukaryotic cells, which means they have a nucleus.